Hey church, Pastor Bobby here. Welcome to Mercy Hill Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really hope this service is an encouragement to you. Let me ask you this as we start. If you know someone else in your life that you think this service would be encouragement to, would you share this video with them? Who knows what God could do in their life just through that one simple act of sharing. Let's lift up our voices now as we worship through song. When I'm surrounded, you part the sea. When I'm in the desert, you're my shade from.
Church, Jesus is our everything, and we know that nothing else can satisfy, and then there's nothing greater than our God. Wow, my heart really needed that reminder today. Hey, thank you again for joining us today. If you're newer to Mercy Hill and you haven't connected with us yet, we would love to connect with you. And we'd love to express our appreciation to you for joining us today by donating $5 to the charity of your choosing. To take advantage of this impactful opportunity, all you have to do is text MH Church to 41411 and complete the brief form that follows. Even though this is a crazy time in our culture with everything going on with COVID, God is still working. Let me tell you about a couple cool things that are happening at Mercy Hill right now. Kids Week is coming August 10th to the 13th. This year, Kids Week isn't happening at our facilities, but in homes, neighborhoods, parks, all around our city. And although we're bummed that we cannot host Kids Week in our facilities this year, we truly believe that God is maybe doing something and something greater than we could ever imagine. Kids Week will be a virtual experience this year. This will include daily projects, worship, lessons, and activities that will teach your family and friends that Jesus is our strong foundation. I wanna personally ask you to think about what family or kid could be impacted through your influence this year. Maybe it's a neighbor, friend, family member that you may wanna to invite to do Kids Week with your family this year. It's never been easier to invite someone to participate. It's free and it's coming up fast. So if you haven't registered, go ahead and do that today. Visit mercyhillchurch.com forward slash Kids Week to register and find more information. Here's another incredible thing that's happening right now. We've all heard Pastor Andrew say that you cannot quarantine the Great Commission, but that's not just a slogan. We are hearing story after story through our online services and now even our outdoor services of people coming to faith in Christ. Not only are people placing their faith in Christ, but throughout the whole month of August, we're gonna to get to see those people get baptized at our outdoor services. This is going to be an incredible celebration of what God has been doing. If you've come to faith and you've not been baptized, we wanna help you take that next step. You can text BAPTIZED to 41411 and a member of our staff will reach out to talk to you about baptism. And if you've not checked out our outdoor services yet, the month of August is a great time to do that. Please note, space is limited for our outdoor services, so be sure to register and reserve your spot for next week's service. Also, if you're not comfortable returning to in-person services, that is totally fine. We wanna to continue to provide online services each weekend, and we'll also make sure that you're able to see those baptisms and celebrate with those who have declared publicly their faith in Jesus. Let's turn our attention now to God's word as we continue in our Functional Church Sermon Series. Hey guys, welcome to Mercy Hill Online this weekend. We're excited to have you. Before I dive into the message for today, uh, I just want to alert everybody again to the two probably greatest mission opportunities you are going to have uh, for the rest of the summer, and that is our Mercy Hill Student Camp and our Mercy Hill Kids Week that are coming up. Y'all, these two opportunities are an absolute powder keg that is waiting for you to drop the match on top of them. I think about our Kids Week, over 600 kids from all over the triad already registered, and we are not even in the final throes of it yet. Can you imagine what's going to happen, Mercy Hill family, if we become the missionaries that God has called us to be in our city, and we decide to get together and do things like post on the community board in our neighborhood about Kids Week, or send out, uh, like me and my wife did, man, name five families that we know that would be super blessed by Kids Week, and just sending them uh, the link to it, or getting together with a couple people from your community group and deciding, man, let's do it together and invite some unbelievers believing friends in. We are living in a time when 
when everything's getting canceled. Uh, so let's think about opening something up and let's think about the joy that it would be for somebody to receive that from you. Uh, I thought about this this week and then we'll move into the sermon. It's like, man, think about if you're an unbeliever right now. Think about if you were an unbeliever and it's like, man, everything's getting canceled. You're having bad news all the time, but somebody loves you enough to send you something that says, hey, my kids are going to be super blessed by this. And I think your kids might be super blessed by this. I think that would be a total blessing in their life. So uh, I'm going to talk about it more in the sermon, but man, let's get after it over the next couple of weeks. Final push for student camp. Man, we got a couple more weeks for kids week. Uh, let's invite like crazy and get those numbers just absolutely through the roof. No telling what God is going to do. It's an easy ask that can have an internal, an eternal impact. All right, so let's get after it. Here we go. Let's dive in. We are going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 today. Uh, we are going to be building upon the message from last week. Last week I talked about how there is a cause in all of our life that touches all the other causes. Man, our life can be about a cause, plethora of things, or it can be about the cause that touches everything. That cause, of course, if you were with us last week, is spreading the knowledge of God. And I want to build on that today. Last week I told you, y'all, that we were created for a cause. This week I want you to hear that we were not only created for a cause, commanded for a cause, but we can have confidence in that cause. Here's the big idea this week. The confidence that uh, to make disciples comes from God, all right? I want to share with you a marvelous truth this weekend, and that is that God's desire for you is confidence, not fear. His desire for you is to authentically feel like you are crushing the cause of your life, like you have something in front of you that you are created to do, that you are on the earth to do, and that you are doing it full speed to the glory of God, that you're doing a great job at it. That's what God wants for your life. He doesn't want you to feel like an imposter. He doesn't want you to feel like, man, I'm a fake. What he wants you to feel like is, I'm gonna infuse the confidence you need into you so that you feel like you are crushing what is in front of you, life's ultimate mission of, of leveraging your life to make disciples, all right? Um, that is what God's calling us to do. There's a task that is in front of that. Now, in front of us, he wants us to feel confident in it. Now, what I want to show you is that many of us live our life either with the task or the confidence, okay, but not both. And this is what happens. What, what happens is if we're like, man, I really want confidence, many people in this life are tempted to take their eyes off the main focus, the cause, because it's so undoable, they feel like. So they begin to say, man, I want to have confidence. Let me lower the aim and expectation of my life. Let me focus on things like, oh, I'm going to do okay with my job, vacations, you know, getting the kids up and gone, uh, I'm, ne the next toy I'm going to buy. As long as that's the focus of my life, I feel like I can control it and I feel like I can have confidence in it. Of course, on the other hand, well, the, the danger with that is that you end up looking back over your life and realize you spent your whole life climbing a ladder that was leaning against the wrong building. Okay, there's a few problems with that, but that's what some people do with confidence. Hey, on the other hand, what some people might do is say, man, I'm just going to accept the fact that I can never have confidence because I have accepted the mission. You know, the mission impossible thing, here's your mission if you should choose to accept it. Many people think, okay, I'm going to accept it, but on the very face of it, leveraging my life to be a disciple maker and influencing all these people, I just feel like there's there's no way I can have an impact in my neighborhood all the way to the nations. And so while I accept the mission, I live in insecurity. I live in fear. I live wondering what God, uh, you know, thinks of me. All of those kind of, listen, God doesn't want you to have either. He wants you to have both. He doesn't want you to feel like the dude that feels like they have been given. I feel like this a lot of times. I feel like I have a job to do, but I don't have the tools. Okay. I come from, some of you guys are going to identify with this. I come from the old school of like, man, if I got a pair of vice grips and some duct tape, I can fix it. It might take me four hours or whatever. But eventually you get to the part where you're like, man, I just don't have the tool to get this job done. I don't have what I need. God wants you to know today with his help leaning on him because the spirit is in you, you can be a spreader of the knowledge of God. You can be a disciple maker. He has given you what you need. He doesn't want you to either aim so low that you can have confidence or accept the mission but feel insecure. He wants you to have both, and we can do that today. He's going to show us that today. Let me show you, all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's walk through this text all the way through. Most of our time will be there, and then we'll spend a little bit of time on the, the back end with kind of an exhortation application for our daily life. Let's dive in. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, 
Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts. Some translations say your hearts to be known and read by all. All right. Let's just kind of ease into this and make sure we understand what's going on. Here's what's up. All right. Paul is talking about letters of recommendation because what he is saying is, do the Corinthians need to know my credentials again? That's what a letter of recommendation is, right? We understand that 2,000 years ago or today, letter of recommendation is the same thing. Will somebody else vouch for the fact that you are who you say you are or that you can do it or that you have the credentials, that's what a letter of recommendation is. I find myself writing a lot of letters, letters of recommendation in a church that has a big vision for adoption and foster care, all right? If you're new to Mercy Hill, man, we want to see 200 families raised up by 2025, uh, building families through adoption, restoring families through foster care, huge vision for our church. And what that ends up is a lot of organizations asking for pastoral references. And so our pastors are doing that a lot. We're writing, writing a letter of rec 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 Recommendation. What are we doing? We're saying they are in a community group. What we're saying is, man, they do serve. You know, they are in the life of the church. They do have people that are within their community. They are growing in the faith. It's a letter of recommendation. It's the same thing 2,000 years ago. Now, is Paul against letters of recommendation? Is that why he's saying, are we having to commend ourselves again? You know, do I have to write a letter of recommendation? I would say it as one commentator did. Paul is not against writing letters of recommendation. He is against needing a letter of recommendation when he's talking to the Corinthian church, okay? Uh, there's a difference there. Man, we see letters of recommendation in Acts. Some people say 3 John is partially a, a letter of recommendation. I mean, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, guys, for you, I should not need a letter of recommendation. I think that's what Paul is getting at. What he's saying is my, uh, my credentials here should speak for themselves because you are Christians. That's the idea. You are the letter. Why would I need anything else? I'm writing to you a church that has been planted and discipled largely in part by me, okay? It was founded by me. Why would you need something else from me? I thought about some examples of this. Uh, I, I think for Paul, it's like, man, there's a couple things going on. I think number one, Paul's ministry should sort of speak for itself, and therefore, why does he need anything else? I, I know that many of us have, have seen uh, uh, the passing of John Lewis, and it kind of made, made me kind of go back and want to want to read up again and things that I've known, but refresh and, and all of that. Y'all, you know, I think about the civil rights movement. It would be like before John Lewis passed away, it would be like him showing up at the Civil Rights Museum right here in Greensboro, North Carolina, and walking in and somebody saying, oh, excuse me, sir, we're going to need to see some credentials for you. It would be like him saying, credentials, you understand why we're all here, <laughs> I mean, you can understand in my 20s, uh, beaten up, arrested countless times. I'm talking about freedom rides, marching to Sel uh, Selma, all of this stuff. It would be like somebody questioning him at the door. That's a little bit like what Paul is saying. You know, you want my credentials. You understand why we're all here, right? You understand how you became the church that you are. Uh, another thing I think that's going on here is that Paul has a Affected and personally discipled many of those in the Corinthian church. I mean, hands on. And for that reason, not just the movement, but them personally, for that reason, it's odd for the letters of recommendation. I, I thought about another example would be like this. It'd be like you just got rescued by a whole group of firefighters and your whole family is huddled outside as the house is burning down. And, and you end up looking at one of the firefighters and say, okay, bud, now I'm going to need to uh, see your ID. I need the credentials that you are who you say you are. It's like you're here. You got saved from the fire. How, what do you mean? There's the truck. Here's the ladder. You got saved from the fire, and yet you want to see my ID? The point is this. The disciples are the letter of recommendation. The commendation of ministry is that disciples are being made. That's what Paul is saying. Do I need a letter? No, I have you. The disciples that are being made is the commendation of Paul's ministry and by extension, our ministry. Guys, you are part of a church that wants to make disciples and multiply churches. We want to plant a bunch of churches and that means that there are many pastors being raised up, many people to be on those church plants, many preachers being raised up. You saw our young communicators weekend a couple of weeks ago. Here's what I feel like I need to do. Because our entire church is on this mission, because our entire church sacrifices 
and gives toward that mission of church planting, I want to talk to those future planters that are going to go out and preach the gospel, people that are going to go out to the nations, the teachers, the preachers that are going to come from this church, young men, young women, aspirations for church planting, missionary, uh, ministry, you know, vocational ministry, whatever it is. I want to talk to them, <clears throat> but in the presence of us all. And here's what I want to say quickly, and then i got to move on. Listen, the commendation of a preacher, the commendation of a teacher is not the amount of Twitter followers somebody has. The commendation for a teacher and a preacher and a vocational minister is not the amount of Instagram likes. It is not the popularity. It's not the notoriety. Those are never the measure and the aim of our success. For Paul, it was changed lives. Those are the commendation of his ministry. That is what he, he says it in 1 Corinthians 9. He looks at the disciples and he says, you are the seal of my apostleship. God has sent me, the proof is in you. Any of us can get this wrong. Y'all, I can get this wrong. I have probably flirted with getting it wrong before in my ministry. But what I wanna say before all of us is this, that if we get this wrong, and I'm telling you, you can smell it, you can see it a mile away. Uh, you, you, you can begin to see when somebody has this wrong. When we have it wrong and we begin to care about other things, other letters of recommendation, rather than the disciples that are being made. Man, many bad things can happen. Number one, we can start preaching a popular therapy instead of an unpopular theology. We can be, uh, number two, we can begin to be mean instead of bold. Number three, we can fall prey to endless comparison. Number four, if we get this wrong, we will begin to take ourselves more seriously than we take the task. And brothers, we are not professionals, as John Piper said. There are so many things that we could talk about here. Y'all, we don't need social media, news articles, magazine recommendation as our letters because we have true letters of recommendation that we should be focused on. And that is the disciples. That's what Paul is saying. He says, hey, you, the Corinthians, you are my letter of recommendation. Verse two, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. I wanna talk to you about discipleship. Discipleship. Discipleship is creating and shaping somebody until they can be known and read by all, until they can stand up to the test, until they are presenting fruit and the examination shows them to be authentic. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God on tablets of stone, uh, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. I want to talk to you about discipleship. It's all about authenticity. Many times people talk about conversions. We talk about discipleship. Y'all, we are called to make disciples, not converts. Now, just to be clear, if anybody is truly converted, they are already a disciple. There is not a later bestowal of discipleship. If the Spirit has sealed you, you are a disciple. But by saying, okay, that we're after disciples, not converts, what we're saying is the job isn't done just because somebody raised their hand at at a student camp. The job isn't done because somebody anonymously popped their hand up in a sermon. The job isn't done because somebody, quote, made a decision. We're not counting decisions. We've taken heat over this uh, in the past about, you know, people raising their hand. and Man, we want to see people moving through discipleship and taking those further steps of getting in the water like we are doing all through the month of August in our outdoor services, all right? Uh, like getting baptized, getting into a group, being shaped because that's what discipleship is all about. What he is saying here is, man, our job is not done because somebody made a decision. We are want after letters that can be read by the whole world, shaped and clear, the message of your life stamped right on your chest. That's what we are after. That's what we're trying to make. Jesus said it another way in Matthew 28. He said, make disciples, teach them to obey what I command. Not just somebody who made a decision, but somebody who is being shaped by the words of Christ, by obedience. He said, you're going to know a tree by its fruit, not because of what it says, but because of what it does. That's how you are going to know. So you could say like this, the life of a disciple is a letter to the world testifying to God's faithfulness, all right? That's what it is. I want to be so clear here when I say this, because what did I just say? I just said the commendation of your ministry is the disciples that are being made, all right? I'm talking about, man, it's clear in their life. What happens when you poured your life into somebody and they walk away? Heartbreak is what happens. It's a tough thing, all right? Many of, you, many of you I know personally, man, you've raised a child your entire life and some of your kids are walking with Christ, some of them walk away. We've had young believers come in. I remember this early on at Mercy Hill, pouring our life into people in group and, and evangelism and all this. They go through the water, they get baptized and up and just walk away from the faith. It's heartbreaking. I think it's actually why Jesus gave us the parable of the sower so that we wouldn't be crushed, but that we would know that is a part of the deal, okay? So I want you to hear this, all right? You never controlled this, it was never in your hands. 
All right, I understand there are going to be in every disciple maker, there are going to be people who they thought were walking with Jesus that ended up were walking with secret sin and ended up turning away. I fully understand that. But I do think what we can see here is while we can't control it, we can be attempting to be what Paul calls us here, which is the delivery person. Okay, well, what does he say here actually in verse 3? He says this, the letter, and that's the disciple, okay, the letter is written by Christ, delivered by us, inked by the Spirit, and written on the paper of the heart of a person. You and I are the mailman. We are the grub, hub, door dash delivery person. That's it. We're not the chef. We're not the ingredients, and it ain't ours to eat. We are the person who is carrying it, okay? There are times when that carrying it works out. There are times when it doesn't. I think by and large, though, it seems to be like this. I had a pastor tell me one time he solved the whole election thing, you know, people being elected and all that. He said, well, man, the more I preach the gospel, the more people seem to be getting elected. I'm not sure exactly how it works, uh, but that's kind of, well, the, what I say is the more people we're trying to disciple, the more disciples are being made, right? That, that, I'm not saying we control it, but I am saying it seems like there is a correlation here, and Paul seems to make that correlation that he says, God is showing that my ministry is fruitful because you are being discipled. There are peoples whose lives are being able to be examined. They're standing up to the test. Not somebody who raises a hand, but somebody whose life, the fruit of their life can be examined. One of the uh, farms I like to follow, just kind of reading about and all that, uh, is in Virginia. And one of the, it's interesting, kind of the new wave of some of this stuff. Uh, the first rule of farming for them is the farm should be accessible to the public and in every way 24-7, 365 days a year. If you want to come see what we do, you come knock on the front door. Now, that's odd for commercial farming, okay? And this is the point that he makes. What he says is in commercial farming, you can't get within a mile of the place because there's barbed wire and armed SWAT team security and security cameras and all of that. And if you even thought about posting a picture, you got seven lawyers that are going to prosecute you. He makes the point that you, you, he's trying to say, hey, our farm, come see it. You test the authenticity for yourself. But if you see something that won't let you in, if you see something that you can't even see what's going on, it ought to give you a little bit of pause. I think that what we are being called to do here is to create people, not converts, not I raise my hand, but their life can stand up to the examination. Not just made a decision, not just anonymous in a service, not just walk forward at a student camp, but can their life stand up to the examination? Are they authentic? Is, is fruit being created? All right. Can they be a letter that is read by the world? This type of discipleship we talk about a lot at Mercy Hill, and I want to dive a little bit deeper into it, and then we're going to move on uh, by saying this. How is a disciple like this made? They're made uh, by the word, and by teaching the word, and by catching life examples, by rubbing off on each other, okay? Lecture lab. You can say it like this. Discipleship is word taught, and it's life caught. All right, I think that it is popular. I have said this before. I don't mean to get on a soapbox, okay? But I think that it's popular in our culture and it sells a lot of books and it ends up having people on conference circuits speaking about discipleship, but they so narrowly define it that actually one of the mentors that I follow says what they are saying by the word discipleship is mentorship. And they're not actually saying discipleship. Because discipleship is any time the word is being taught and life is being caught, there is discipleship happening. Jesus did ministry uh, in many phases. He did ministry with the crowd. He did ministry with the 70. He did ministry with the 12. He did ministry with the three. I am not saying that ministry with the three and mentoring apprenticeship type ways is not discipleship. Oh, it definitely is. I'm just saying that the rest of it is as well. Okay, so when we define discipleship in a way where sermons and community group and the fact that you are a kids volunteer, you are not discipling by doing all that, give me a break. It's all discipleship. Most Christians, I bet you anything under the sound of my voice uh, that, are, that are watching this, uh, okay, I bet you anything, if you got a piece of paper out, you have been discipled in hundreds of different ways by dozens and dozens of people. Man, do we need more of an emphasis on the three? Absolutely. We're actually taking some strides in that in groups and through evangelism this very fall. Things that I can't uh, tell you how excited I am about them and, and looking forward to that. We need to take more strides into that. But to not think that every disciple is, is built by a matrix of influences. One guy says like this, man, it takes a church to raise a disciple. And that is so true. All right. You, my point is this. In all of these different areas, some of us think today, man, I can't disciple somebody. I've never been 
discipled. I can't disciple somebody because I don't know how to sit one on three with somebody else or whatever. What I want you to hear is you can disciple. You can be part of the, ma the matrix of influences that goes in to somebody's life. There is no second bestowal of discipleship status. If you are a Christian, you are a disciple and therefore can help make disciples. Maybe it is through apprenticing and mentoring and, and asking somebody one-on-one, -on -one, hey, read the Bible with me for eight weeks. It's not rocket science. Let's read it. Let's figure out where it's rubbing against us. Let's work it out and let's pray over it. It's not rocket science, but it doesn't have to be that. Serving in kids' ministry, serving age-based ministry like students, being intentional to be in your community group, maybe lead a community group, host a group, Bible study with your kids, the things that you post on social media, a mission trip, as simple as inviting younger couples over to watch how you do dinner and kids and bedtime and all of that. Listen, it is all discipleship. And if we think it's not, we have defined it way too narrowly. I want you to have confidence that you can disciple. It is not the pastor's job. We equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It is all of our job. Such confidence can be yours. Look what it says in verse four. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that's coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, of, not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Look, there's a thousand things I could talk about here and I don't have time to talk about all of them. I mean, one of them is that Paul starts mixing his metaphors here, which I'm gonna ask him in heaven one day why he does does that. I'm pretty sure he does that so that guys like me have a job to explain it all. I don't know why he does it, okay? He's mixing metaphors. He's talking about the letter killing. He's talking about the law. He's talking about the tablets. Does he mean the heart? Does he mean uh, the Old Testament law? I mean, what, you know, all this kind of stuff. I hope that you dive deeper into this and you can study it on your own. I want to keep the main thing the main thing, and here's what I want you to see. Like Paul, you and I are supposed to, can, God wants you to have the confidence in our disciple-making ability because of the sufficiency God God has given us, all right? Our sufficiency is in God. It is not in ourselves. You have been made a sufficient minister of the new covenant. Say new covenant. What does that mean? For our purposes today, I just want you to hear the word gospel, all right? That what the law could not do, God did, as Romans 8 says. He sent Jesus to live, to die, and to raise for you. In your place, penalty for your sin removed, the reward of Jesus' what life well lived before God is bestowed upon you. Jesus in your place fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. God sees you as sinless. He sees you as perfect. He sees you as righteous. He sends his spirit into your life, not only so that you would be seen that way by God, but that practically in your life, you would be reminded of God's love for you and you would be moved towards a practical righteousness. We are ministers of the new covenant because Jesus sealed the new covenant with his blood, okay? You are a minister. I know, I know we say it like this, every member a missionary. Some churches say every member a minister, okay? And I think that's right. Every minister, a, every member a minister of the new covenant. I know somebody here is going to say, man, ain't that just for Paul? Not on your life. It is for every one of us. The Bible tells us because of the gospel, you are part of the kingdom of priests, Revelations 1.6. You are called to make disciples, Matthew 28. You are a light to the nations. You are part of that people that Isaiah talked about so many years ago. Maybe I can say it like this. Listen, young professional, you are a sufficient minister of the new covenant among your friends. Business person, you are a sufficient minister of the new covenant in your company. Moms and dads, you are a sufficient minister of the new covenant in your home. Not because you're great, not because you're competent, not because you're talented, but because God moves through you. You're just a delivery person. Remember, you're not the chef, you're not the ingredients, you're not the one eating, but you are the one driving that little Moped, Grubhub, okay? You're the one that is going uh, to bring it, and that is who you are. He has made you sufficient for that task. And I think when we get that in our mind, y'all, it begins to unleash the power to dream, the power to swing, you know, the, the power to go after it. That's what it unleashes in us. Uh, I, I think many of us, again, we say, man, I've never been mentored, and we say, I've never been discipled. I think that's the wrong terminology to use. Man, I've never had this three on, three on one, one on three. I hope that you do. That shouldn't be as hard as it is. If you're older and somebody younger wants to sit with you, if you're younger, ask somebody that's older. It really shouldn't be that difficult. But even if that hasn't happened in your life yet, the thought that you don't have what you need to be a discipler is ludicrous. Okay, uh, I, I thought about an example like this. 
You know, we, I told you we like to go camping, and sometimes we'll be in a campground, and we'll see uh, these, these guys drive in with the most massive truck you have ever seen, and then this little small camper that they're pulling, okay? And, and it's funny, because you, you, you could just tell immediately, like, that dude went to his wife, and he's like, babe, it's a safety thing. I got to have, you know, the F-350 diesel dually, you know, I mean, truck can pull 35,000 pounds, literally, could probably pull 30,000 pounds, the camper weighs 5,000 pounds, but, like, but for safety, you know, I got to have uh, this brand new, you know, whatever. But it's so funny to me because what you, you see them come in, they're all decked out and all that. You know what it'd be like? It would be like somebody saying, you know, I bought the, the, the Dodge Ram 3500 dually. The thing weighs 15,000 pounds. It could th- tow 30,000 pounds, but I can't pull this 5,000 pound camper because I don't have the right tow mirrors. It would be like, what? You have the engine inside. You've got everything, 99.9% of what you need to crush what is right in front of you, you already have. And so many of us say, well, I can't be a disciple maker because I'm not a leader. I, don't, I can't be a disciple maker because I've never been mentored. I, 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 came, for, I, never, I'm, I've, I came from a broken home. I've never been to seminary. 0.1%, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have been uh, baptized, if you are a believer, you have followed through, I mean, you are walking with Christ, the Spirit is in your life, you have the engine, you have the horses, you have what you need to be able to do this. You can start a Bible study at work. You can adopt or foster or guardian ad litem for the sake of sharing the gospel. You can post something on the community board in your neighborhood and invite some neighborhood kids into the garage like I heard one family is going to do in order to be able uh, to write in their front yard, go through the kids week material with them. You can ask somebody if they want to read the Bible with you for five or six weeks. You can ask somebody, hey, uh, we have a new sermon series coming up in September. We're going to be doing Redeemed. We're going to be talking about the book of Ruth. Think about in your mind right now, who could use that? Who could you ask now? Hey, why don't you, why don't we watch these together and we'll just talk about them. a little watch and talk thing for eight weeks. No more than that. Easy on ramp, easy off ramp. You can do that. You have been made sufficient. Another way to say that is made able. Another way to say that is made confident, okay, or competent. You can do it. All right, application point will be done. Make disciples with confidence, okay? The confidence comes not because you're awesome. It comes in the form of something else coming over you. And I feel like we feel like this in real life. You ever had a mentor and when they, when they, when they, when they, when they just kind of see what you're doing and they think it's right, it gives you such confidence. I, 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 uh, I had a chance this past week to sit down with my kind of older brother in the faith, mentor totally, Pastor J.D. Greer from the Summit uh, Church, and, and just, just sitting with him and talking to him about what we're doing and talking to him about the way I'm thinking about things, just to have that older brother mentor kind of say, man, I think you're thinking about it the right way. I'm thinking about it the same way. I mean, it gives you such confidence, doesn't it? Like just in this life, just normal. You know, my wife is always, she always jokes, I'm 36 and I still save up the dangerous hard projects for when my dad's gonna come up from Florida. It's like, why? It just gives me confidence. He knows how to do everything, you know? It just gives me a little bit of, of confidence. If it's like that in this life, then what is it like when I say we have an incredibly hard task? It is undoable on one hand, yet inevitable on the other. What kind of confidence does it inspire when I say this task that God has given you, the cause, the God of this universe is there to infuse confidence in you. The spirit is in you. You can do it. I understand what it's like to be a little bit, man, fearful and to be a little bit like, man, can I do this? I think about when I'm driving through, uh, I remember driving through South Asia. It felt like every 30 minutes we were in a new area and they would say, this is a new people with a new language. There is no church. 30 minutes later, new people, new language. There is no church. It can feel super daunting. I I think about uh, the people that we have worked with in Peru, the Yanashen, my prayer for them from the very beginning is like, man, if they are reached, there are still unreached, unengaged tribes that have never been contacted in the Amazon through many of the borders there. Man, they rub shoulders in some people, in some cases with tribes that rub shoulders with the uncontacted. And I think if they are reached and if a church planning movement takes off, but it feels so daunting. You know what infuses confidence real quick when you realize, wait a minute, you're not the author, you're not the ink, you're not the end game, you're just the delivery person. And God is saying, you can have confidence in me because of what I am going to do. Let me close with three quick exhortations, all right? The first one is this, hey, be a letter from Jesus to the world. What does that mean? Hey, if you have not stepped over the line, you need to step over the line and come to faith and get baptized this month. 
You need to come out from behind the internet and get into the water, okay? And that's what I'm going to call you to do. Maybe you've been watching for a few months with us. Maybe you've been kind of hanging with us. Man, the Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart. It is time to let him in, to confess your sin, to believe that Jesus went to the cross, to believe that in him you can have the newness of life. Hey, let's do that today. Let's let somebody know. Don't do that in anonymity. Man, let that be known to us so that we can have uh, the right steps in place to get you baptized, to hook you up with a disciple-making ministry like community groups or whatever. Hey, the second thing I would say though is this, Christian, convert, okay? You are a letter. How legible are you? <laughs> you know, one, one, uh, one pastor said like this, you know, for a Christian, you shouldn't need to be able to read calligraphy to understand the letter. You shouldn't need, the, the world shouldn't have to be able to understand all this crazy stuff to see the message on your chest is loud and clear. Is it that way for you? Or is it kind of blurry? I remember, uh, you know, I'm notorious for, uh, I have bad handwriting, number one, so people can't read what I say. But then number two, uh, I have a bad habit of doing the voice to text and then don't read back what I say. And so it ends up, um, man, just, uh, I don't know, a few months ago or whatever. It's funny, uh, we actually called Pastor Jeremy Dager uh, Tiger now, even though he has a huge lion tattooed on one of his arms, so it's very confusing. But, uh, but we, th we called Tiger, and it comes from this. Uh, he said, one time he texted us a few months ago, he said, hey guys, my house tonight after service, whenever somebody texts back, okay, see you there. This was my, literally, this, they, they, they saved it. This was the text that I sent back. Tiger, thanks, would love to. But I've been going tonight, this week already. I am bringing the family church in the we're doing nice cream after. Okay, I mean, it's like, he texts me back. Uh, they, don't, they, they all text back one word, wow. Okay, that was the only word that they text back. I, I understand, you ever text something and it's like totally unclear? Hey, is your life a letter to the world that's clear or is it a voice to text that got all jumbled and nobody knows what it's supposed to be saying? Is it clear, are you being a letter that's like, man, it's clear they're living for a kingdom that is not their own. It is very clear what they're about. It is clear that they are changed by God. What steps do you need to take in obedience? Giving for the first time, uh, maybe getting in a group when we get back. Hey, new month, jumping into new reading habits. I told you, chapter of Proverbs, chapter of Psalms, chapter of something else in the book that you're working through takes 15 minutes, okay? I don't know what you need to do in terms of changing obedience. Let's be a letter. Second thing is this, deliver letters from Jesus. Not just be a letter, but deliver deliver other letters. What I mean is, are you trying to make disciples? Are you being the delivery person? Okay. And I've talked about this the whole time. You can, if you're not, if you're confident, if you're trying to be, I'm confident, but I'm, 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 I'm not leaning on God. It's because you're aiming at your life at something way too small. That's the only way that's possible. If you get into, my life is about leveraging and making disciples, and then you start thinking about your confidence, it's going to have to be that you lean on God for the mission. Man, what's right in front of us? Kids Week, outdoor services, sending sermons to people, discipling others and mentoring opportunities is awesome. I hope you get a chance to do that. But you can do it in a lot of other ways, and you ought to be stepping in to those opportunities. Thirdly and finally, send letters from Jesus to the nations. When we planted Mercy Hill, people said, why would you plant in the South? Number one, because at that time the church was dying in the South faster than any other region in the United States. And number two, because we wanted to build a sending center. Let us build a, a, a runway here that we could send people to the nations to reach those who have no access, to reach those who have little access, or to reach places that God is placing on our heart uniquely. And we have done it seven years, 13 church plants, from Hispanic church planting right here in the triad to places like Roanoke, Virginia, all the way to South Asia. Man, praying that we will continue to see ministry, uh, missionaries and pastors raised up to be sent out. Hey, people like Abby, who in 2019, when we stood on the stage, you guys remember this? of you were here at all of our campuses and said, write your big prayer request down. She wrote down that God would send me to the nations. And that's happening right now, about to leave next week, going to Uganda for two years. I mean, this stuff is happening, okay? We're seeing it. I want to say this. Hey, are you sending a letter? We will send more letters as we give more money. With increased generosity will come increased sending. The opportunities abound right now. Seminary for future planners, bringing in residents during COVID, creating a Spanish-speaking arm to our residency process. All of this stuff, y'all, is right in front of us if we had the generosity that it would take to continue to get us there. Look, I know, and I hope that doesn't sound tone deaf right now, I understand where we're at economically as a nation. I get that. But as a pastor, here's what I got to square. Y'all, over the last couple of months, as the economy has turned down, so has the giving at Mercy Hill. And, and, we, and, and that's just a reality. And the fact is that right now, because of wisdom and because of the way that God has set us up, it hasn't affected ministry too much. But over the time, over time, 
if we continue in this cycle, yes, there will be things that we want to do this year and beyond that we will have to pull off the board. And I don't want us to get there. I just want to call us, church, to remember that through increased generosity comes increased sending. Can we send letters to the nation, all right? Hey, God is building a functional church through dysfunctional people. Man, we have insecurities, we have fears. He wants to infuse with confidence and make a disciple-making bunch of people from us. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your spirit would just be alive and well in the church. Father, we organize things, but we are an organism taking the, taking the gospel into every nook and cranny of our society. Father, I pray that every member of Mercy Hill would be unleashed by the power of God and the power of the spirit to mission in their neighborhood all the way to the nations. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, church. We are going to continue worshiping now through our giving. At Mercy Hill, we believe that generosity fuels the mission. One of the ways we're seeing this in full effect is through members of Mercy Hill being raised up and sent out to the nations. As our country has been in various stages of lockdown and quarantine, Abby Henson's one of those being sent out. It's been challenging packing up her life here in the United States, saying difficult goodbyes to family and friends. But when Abby leaves in a few short months, she'll be going with the knowledge that Jesus Jesus is worth it and that God can use her to make disciples and multiply churches in a really difficult place. Church, I want to be super clear. As we partner together and give financially to the mission, it's your generosity that enables us to see missionaries like Abby raised up to be sent out to the nations. God's done incredible things through your giving, but there are so many places around the world where the name of Jesus has not been heard. What could God do through us to send people to those places so that one day every tribe, tongue, and nation declares that Jesus is Lord? If you're not already, would you partner with us in giving financially to continue to see more and more missionaries raised up and sent out from Mercy Hill? It is so easy to give through our online platform. Just text MHGIVE to 41411 or visit our Give page on our website. Also, as we are coming up to a new month, I wanna encourage you to think about making your giving recurring. This is what my wife Allison and I do. We believe that God has called us through his word to give at least a tithe each month, which is 10% of our income. And we do this through having a recurring gift set up. That way each month our giving is something that's prioritized. Let's continue worshiping now through song. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He would give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing love the Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now let's boast only in Jesus Christ right now as we sing together. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. God for his perfect love for us. I hope you've enjoyed this service. As we close out our service today, I want to encourage you to like and subscribe to our social media channels. This is a great way to get the latest content from Mercy Hill. Also, I want to point you to our website. Our site is loaded with resources for our families, and you can also find opportunities to serve. In addition, our site's also the best place to get the most up-to-date information about reopening our facilities, including details about our outdoor service. Mercy Hill, God has equipped and called every believer to be on mission for such a time as this. Mercy Hill Church, you are sent out.